Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's webinar. My name is Adam, and I'll be your moderator. Dr. Renee Kurtz is our speaker tonight, and she will be talking about how she leverages her intraoral scanner to achieve accurate and more detailed scans. If at any point you have a question, please, please type it into the box labeled, have a question, and we'll do live Q&A at the end of the webinar. And Henry Schein is not offering CE credit for viewing or viewing the webinar live or on demand. All right, Dr. Kurtz, over to you. Great. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us today. My name is Renee Kurtz, and uh, I'm going to be talking about scanning tonight and basically, you know, starting with the basics in intraoral scanning. Um, I'm going to be going over um, the uh, CEREC scanner itself and then um, some cases that I've done with the scanner at the end. Um, like Adam said, I will try to um, watch the um, question box. So if you do have any questions, I'll try to answer them as I go. Uh, if not, I can uh, get them at the end as well. So again, my name is Renee Kurtz. I am a general dentist in Cheshire, Connecticut. Um, I've been a CEREC user since 2012. Um, I opened my practice in 2010. Uh, it was just a startup. I didn't uh, buy anyone out or anything. And when I opened, I really, really wanted to get CEREC. So um, I did have to wait a couple of years to kind of build up to be able to get it in. But uh, I've had it you know, since uh, 2012. And it's really been just a game changer for my practice um, and practice building. So um, I love dental technology. Um, I love to integrate anything I can into my practice within reason. And um, you know, I just wanted to point out, I am a, a faculty member at the LA Institute of Clinical Dentistry, and a lot of the prep designs and stuff that I talk about, I do go over um, in the, at the LA Institute. So if you had any questions about that, feel free to reach out to me as well. So what is CEREC? So this is a picture of the, the uh, scanner, and um, it's a chair-side economical restoration of aesthetic ceramics. So um, obviously it is chair-side. This uh, piece of equipment sits next to me um, pretty much at all time. Um, economical, it um, really is a great practice builder. Uh, to be able to do crowns in one visit is highly productive. Um, it, obviously, we are doing restorations. Uh, there's all different types of ceramics that you can use. There are more aesthetic ceramics that you can use if you're doing, you know, something more in the anterior. And then uh, there are more durable ceramics that you can use um, in the posterior. So there's just there's dozens of them out there. It's really kind of personal preference, whichever um, types of black that you want to use. So why go digital? Um, again, like I said, I wanted to integrate this into my practice as fast as I could. Um, yeah, a lot of people don't really like taking impressions. They're very messy. Um, sometimes people have gag reflexes where they just don't like you know, having that mush in their mouth. Um, the digital impressions I find are much more precise. Uh, with regular impressions, you can get some like expansion and contraction. Whereas, you know, you're in, and even human error in, in pouring models or even mixing impression materials or something. So you take that all um, away and you get really, really precise um, uh, images. The great thing is you don't have to wait for your impressions. You can, or for your restorations, I'm sorry, you get them, you know, within a, about an hour. Um, I'm probably at about an hour and 15 from start to finish. And my patients leave, you know, with a permanent restoration. You don't have to worry about temporaries falling off, um, which always come off, of course, after hours or on weekends or holidays or something. Uh, and you know, also with temporaries, if they're not made very well, you can have open margins and you can get you know some post-op sensitivity, which is you know never fun for the patient or poor for you because you're getting those patients back and taking up chair time. To be able to do an impression, or I'm sorry, a restoration in one visit, it's obviously less chair time. You don't have to bring the patient back and set up the room again, get the patient numb. Uh, patients love it because they're not taking more time off of work or school or, you know, getting babysitters for the kids and stuff. So uh, they really, really, really love it. Uh, sometimes I even have patients that are not my patients. They might be at another office. 
but they'll come to me uh, because they know I can do crowns, you know, in an hour. And, you know, it, sometimes they become patients. So, you know, it really is a, a great practice builder. Um, the, all the restorations look very natural. They feel uh, really great. And again, with the materials, there are much more sturdy materials, like I said, to use in the posterior, or you can use a little bit more aesthetic stuff in the, uh, in the interior. Um, Adam, I just am looking, um, someone's saying other slides or photos, they only see me, not the yep, program. I'm working with them. Okay, should I stop, wait for a minute? Uh, you can keep going. Oh. Um, I love this photo. Um, I, I, and I, I sometimes show this to either patients or even other doctors that are um, interested in CEREC. So we all know when we send a case to the lab, you know, we get a whole bunch of stuff back. It's all wrapped in either paper towels or bubble wrap. And you, know, you get the poured models, you get your impressions back. And then when you compare that to just the little piece left over, you know, from um, your block, it's really, you know, a great, great for the environment. And you're not going through all these models and, and all that. And, you know, if you're doing a lot of cases or if you're a multi-dentist practice, you're going to have a lot of these boxes, you know, taking up room in your office. So it is so nice to just be able to have this little piece throw it out, you know, do whatever you want with it and not have to store everything and wait, you know, weeks for your patients to come back before you can get rid of all this stuff. So uh, the benefits of single visit dentistry, um, I guess, you know, the, the greatest thing is the, the speed and efficiency that you can practice. It is very easy to just scan a patient. I'll show a video in a little bit. You know, it can take you, you know, less than a minute, maybe even a couple minutes when you're first starting and you send it right over to the, the milling. Um, you can also be much more efficient, you know, because you are doing uh, the crown in one visit. Again, you don't have to get the patient back. Um, it's a great thing to, uh, to get patients in the door for growth and expansion. Um, it's just a really, really great tool. The quality is amazing. Like I said, you're taking out any human error with, you know, not taking um, an impression properly or having to retake an impression and then sending it to a lab and hoping that, you know, they capture your margins properly and stitch the dye right. And so, you know, when they come out of the milling machine, they are uh, very um, precise fitting. They look great and the patients just really, really appreciate them. They love not having temporaries too and not having to, uh, to, to do two visits. Um, and it's very easily integrated right into your practice. Um, uh, Dense Slides Runner works very well with, uh, with you to educate you to use the piece of equipment and technical support is just amazing. Um, you know, even if you're in with a patient and, you know, a, a glitch happens or something, you can get on, on the phone with somebody in, you know, minutes and they can, you know, log in and, and get you going so you don't waste um, any time at all. Then also integrating into your practice with your your staff. Um, a lot of what the scanner does, um, my staff does. You know, I go in and I will um, scan the um, my my tooth and do you know, get it going. And then a lot of the times the assistants can do the rest. They can design if you want. You can design it. Your assistants can design it. They do all the um, the milling, um, the glazing, so you're free to to be able to do something else, whether you know you're working on another patient or working in another part of the patient's mouth. So it's very very easily um, integrated into your practice and very easy to train you know, your staff to help you with it. So these are the steps um, uh, from scanning all the way to making the crown. So um, after you're done with your preparation, you have the, like it's like an intraoral camera that you use to scan your tooth, uh, your prep, you, the adjacent teeth, the opposing teeth, and then a bite, just kind of like you're taking like a triple tray or something. Um, and then once you are done with the scan, um, the patients like to see it. They like to see how their teeth look. And I actually kind of go through the design with them. You can um, make it, they, it, it comes up with, um, what it thinks will, will fit into the patient's mouth. 
you tell it ahead of time, like what tooth it is, say if you're doing tooth number three, um, it'll take tooth number three and put it into your prep design and then the adjacent and opposing teeth. And then you can go in and make any little modifications you know, that you want. Once that's done, you just hit send and send it over to the milling unit. Um, depending on what you're milling and the size of the tooth, it can take anywhere from eight to 12 minutes or so. Um, it's, it's really fast. Uh, again, it's, it's extremely precise and you get nice, you know, smooth surfaces, you get great contacts. Um, and then so once it is done milling, you want to stain and glaze. Um, and this is all done again by my assistants. Um, you put a little glaze on the tooth and you send it into the firing. And after about 15 minutes or so, your tooth is ready. And so they also have an option if you don't want to make the crowns in your practice, and you just wanted to get into the um, digital impressions. There's this thing called Seric Connect where you can still send it to the lab. If you, you, know, you have a great lab that you wanna work with and you don't wanna mill in your office, um, you can use Sarah Connect. So basically with that, you will still scan you know, the upper and lower arches and your preps. Um, once you do that, just check to make sure you've got your margins, you've got good quality scans, and then you hit a button and send it to whatever um, lab that you want. If you've been working with a great lab, you can continue to work with them. Uh, you can also, if you start getting into um, other types of uh, restorations like implants or doing uh, full mouth scanning for clear aligners and sleep apnea treatment, you just scan the patient and you can send it right over to your lab. So it really takes out the, the time that you need to either mail um, or if you have a courier come and pick it up. It just, it takes a few days off um, your patient getting their restoration back. And like I said, most labs in the country around the world really um, are, are hooked up with CEREC. So I'm sure whatever lab that you are using um, does um, have connection with, the, uh, with CEREC. So like I said, very, this uh, digital scanning is very, very easy. Um, you really don't have to change the way that you work. Um, you're really just removing the impressions and making temporaries. Uh, it is very easy to scan. Like I said, it can take you maybe a minute or so, um, and I will show you a video in a little bit for that. Um, the accuracy is great. You know, you're not having to worry about any sort of expansion and contraction with impressions. Uh, you're not worried about people not being able to, um, to, to do impressions, whether they're gaggers or anything like that. Um, you get really high quality um, restorations from it. It is very fast. Again, if, uh, if you're making it in your office, you can have that crown done in about an hour. Your patient doesn't have to come back. You don't have to you know, put them back in your schedule. So it really frees up your time to be more productive and efficient in your practice. If you're sending it via Sarah Connect, it is very safe, OSHA compliant. Um, they are very high quality um, files and um, the, the labs will get them within a minute or so and they can start processing your, your restoration. Um, like I said, the connections are all over. Um, so you can use you know, really any lab uh, of your choice. If you've been working with a great lab, you stay with them. Um, you know, there's over 2 million orders a year, and when they come back, they are as better fitting than if you had sent um, a regular impression. So here's the first video. It's going to start this. So this is a video of uh, me scanning a patient. The video is about a minute long. Um, I do take a little extra time just so I can sit and talk through it, but... Um, we are doing a uh, tooth number two, so it is a little far back, uh, but as you can see, it's very easy. The patient, I'm not stretching the patient wide open to try to get back there. Uh, it's very easy to get the intraoral camera in there. It's nice and sleek and small, so you're not, uh, you don't have to choke your patient or make them uncomfortable at all to be able to get that scan. So what I'm doing is just scanning the upper right now. And the most important thing to get is um, your prep, uh, the uh, contact. So you want to get the contact of the adjacent teeth, um, the occlusals, and the, the buccal surfaces as well to line up your, your bite afterward. 
And then I just go down and switch to the opposing arch. On the opposing arch, you just kind of scan along to get the um, occlusal surfaces and then come around to get the, uh, the buckle surfaces here. You always wanna make sure everything is nice and dry too. You don't want to scan any um, air bubbles in saliva or any blood on your, um, your prep because then you're not getting a really great um, uh, scan and it can get some, you know, it, it may not have as good of a fit. So it's very easy to be able to do that there. I had just done um, the bite so that the, um, the machine will take into consideration, you know, the bite and occlusion and, and all sorts of forces. So when you're done and you know you have a good scan, this will pop up. So um, you can see I got both the upper and lower in, in here. And when you get your bite, you'll get this little check mark. So you know that your scans are good, uh, that they're fitting together, and then you can go ahead. If you don't get this check, you may want to go back and maybe look, you know, did I did I get a good enough scan? You usually want to get at least three to four uh, teeth in each arch if you're just doing a single unit, uh, just, just for accuracy. If you're only capturing one or two teeth, you may not get a good bite. So you really want to make sure you get enough in all your scans. Oh, and this video here, the machine will outline your prep. That's that bluish purplish line around it. Um, if you wanted to change it, you can go back and make sure that you, you get the margins properly. And then, like I said, it, it, you tell it ahead of time. So I told it I'm doing tooth number two. So it puts that tooth number two into, again, your prep, into occlusion. And um, then you can use the tools on the side to just go back and modify your prep a little bit. Um, one thing Sarah is really good at is getting a lot of um, anatomy in your tooth. Um, I tend to kind of go over and smooth that anatomy out a little bit. Your patients are going from most likely, you know, broken down old restoration that's probably really flat and worn down. And that's kind of what they're used to. So if you put a lot of anatomy back into the tooth, sometimes they say it feels rough or weird or something like that. So I don't remove the anatomy, but I do just kind of smooth it out a little bit. So um, there, I was just checking the bite, making sure it fits well with uh, the opposing teeth and checking my, um, my contacts. This is um, the tools to adjust the crown. In that video, it's kind of in the upper right corner. So here you can add, subtract, smooth out your restoration, and you can do it in different sizes. If you just want to make a small little adjustment, you reduce the size. If you're adjusting a small area, like you want to smooth off a cusp or something, you increase the size um, to, to adjust that. And then this last video, um, this I just wanted to show how it mills. So this is a block that I put in um, the milling unit and you can see there's two burrs on either side and uh, water will spit out uh, to them to keep everything cool. And these two little, little burrs just go back and forth to uh, mill out the crown. And again, I said, usually takes about eight to 12 minutes or so. Um, and then you can um, glaze it and put it right into the oven. And one last video here. So this is it going into the oven. The, uh, the oven is that piece on the top left. Um, it is closed right now. I always keep it closed because it's at about 550 degrees Celsius. So I'm putting a little putty on the inside of the tooth and covering the margins before I glaze. You never ever want to get glaze inside your prep or on your margins because then it won't seat properly. So you want to make sure that that is all covered. Um, so now I'm holding it and I'm going to be spraying some uh, glaze onto here. Sometimes I'll put some stain in the grooves or something. Um, not very often. Again, patients will look at it and say, oh, I have this beautiful new crown and, you know, all this you know, stain on it. So it's great for anteriors um, to put a little character into uh, the restorations. Uh, but on posteriors, I usually just glaze and put it in the oven. So here we are putting it into the oven. And again, my assistants do all of this. Once um, it goes to um, the, the milling unit, again, I'm off doing hygiene checks, paperwork, um, working on another patient, or working on the same patient, just maybe on a different tooth uh, in the mouth. And so once that gets going, you see it gets bright red, that will eventually close. 
you just leave it be there. Um, there's all settings on the machine on the bottom. You see like five little buttons and it's depending on what type of restoration you're using. There's certain settings so you know exactly how long it needs to uh, go in the oven. So here's a bit about prep design. And again, this is a lot of stuff that we go over um, in the LA Institute of Clinical Dentistry. With, we're working with ceramics. We're not um, working with PFM. So we work with adhesive bonding. So we don't have to worry about, you know, the three millimeter retention and, and all that. So the, you know, first thing you look at is thickness of the material so that you have a strong material. If something is too thin, you run the risk of it fracturing at some point especially when you're in the, the molar areas. So I would say you want at least a minimum of 1.5 to 2 millimeters thickness on the occlusal. You can go down to about a millimeter on the axial walls. You want to follow the occlusal morphology of the tooth and of the opposing teeth. If your prep is too flat, you know, you may have two, two and a half millimeters thickness in one area, but maybe only one millimeter in another. So it's really important to follow the uh, occlusal morphology of the tooth. If you're doing, say, an inlay, um, you want that transitional area to be at least two millimeters. Um, if it's too thin, again, you run the risk of fracture and having to redo your restorations. You also want all internal rounded angles. You don't want any sharp spots that CEREC may not be able to pick up or it may not be able to mill. Um, so if there's a really sharp area, it may come out a little bit more rounded so that when you go to put your restoration in, it's going to hit on that area. So if you do happen to leave, you know, a sharp angle and your restoration is not sitting, you may want to just kind of go in and, and smooth that off. But ideally beforehand, before, before you scan. Undercuts are never good with any type of impressioning, but with the, the digital scanning, it won't really recognize um, that and, and you may not be able to, to fit your restoration. So make sure that you have uh, no undercuts. I think the most important thing on here is staying super gingival. Um, I think that is just so important. Uh, once you drop your margins down under the gums, you are constantly fighting saliva and blood and, and you know, that will mess up your skin. Uh, it will mess up any impression, even regular impressioning. You, you may not be able to um, capture your margins properly. So just with it, it with the digital impressioning as well, you want to make sure you stay above the gums so that your scanner can see all your margins. If you can't see the margins, neither can your scanner. So you really want to make sure you can stay super gingival. We're working with ceramics, so we don't have to bury any, you know, anesthetic margins. So keeping it above the gums. Uh, keeping your margins on enamel would be wonderful to get a better bonding. We know we can, you know, bond really, really well to enamel. Sometimes that's not possible, but if you're um, if you're going subgingival, you really a lot of times you just prep away all the enamel. So that um, you know, being able to stay on enamel will give you a better, long-lasting restoration. Simple bevels, smooth margins. You don't need you know any any feather edges or anything like that. You will your um, restorations can eventually chip, so you want nice smooth butt margins keep the restoration nice and smooth and so that you can capture all the margins as well. And you also wanna have slight um, interproximal separation. If your, your margin is right up against the adjacent tooth, you're really not gonna be able to, to see it well. So even if you just go in, you know, with the little feather edge or something and just, just get rid of just a little bit um, in between so that the um, the scanner can see all your margins nice and clearly. Um, it'll make, you know, everyone's life uh, much easier. And in following all these, you know, to be able to, to see all your margins and having a good prep, it really makes you a better dentist because if you're, you know, just kind of prepping fast and, oh, I'll get that margin, you know, it'll be able to see it. You know, you really want really crisp, um, uh, preps, and so it really makes you step up your game for your um, your prepping. This, I love this slide. I have this on my computer. I put it up all the time to show patients. Um, I very, very rarely will prep a full coverage crown unless I'm really taking off another crown and, and having to uh, prep it uh, full crown. Uh, when you're prepping a full crown, you're really removing like 
a good 75% of the tooth structure, then you're really removing all the enamel, and that's really what we want to bond to. And when we remove too much tooth structure, we know we get closer to the nerve, and you just run the risk of um, needing a root canal or having some sensitivity on the tooth. So being able to prep more of like an onlay prep, you know, depending on the tooth, every tooth I feel is different. And I don't really know what I'm going to prep until I get into the tooth. And if I, you know, see decay or any fracture lines in, um, in the tooth, I kind of, you know, prep accordingly. So sometimes I'm doing a straight onlay and sometimes it's like a three quarter crown or something. Um, but in just looking at this, it's just so much easier to see all your margins on the middle tooth as opposed to if you're starting to bury them uh, under the gums. Again, if they're under the gums, you're fighting with uh, saliva and blood, and you're just not going to capture a really uh, good image. So this is just a great picture to show. And like I just said before, if you can't see your margins, neither can your scanner. So always make sure when you're looking straight down on your tooth, you can see your margins. Um, you, you know, the adjacent teeth aren't kind of falling into your prep. If they are, you may want to modify, you know, the restoration or tooth adjacent to it so you can look down and get a really good path of insertion. So if you do have, you know, any sort of undercut or if the, the tooth adjacent to it um, is causing an undercut, you're not able to see the restoration. You know, the lab can kind of smooth it off a little bit, um, and then you're kind of trying to retrofit your tooth in there. So just starting from the beginning, being able to look down and seeing your entire prep, um, and then your your um, your scanner will be able to see it. And then on the right, it's just kind of showing following the morphology of the tooth and following the um, opposing dentition so that you have the at least the minimum thickness required on that entire prep. If you had kind of just gone straight across, you'd have a thin, it'd be too thin in the middle. And again, you can run the risk of fracturing your restoration at some point. You also want to have really clean preps. You know, if there's uh, blood in the way, the, the, the scanner may not know the exact depth of your restoration and you can have an open margin. Um, again, and if there's saliva or a, like an air bubble or something, um, it's, it's going to capture that. So just kind of, you know, take your water syringe and just blow some air. Um, if there's bleeding, you want to, you know, be able to take care of that. Whether uh, you're using, let's see here, whether you're using cord or any sort of lasers, you want to just make sure everything is nice and clean uh, before you um, start taking your scan. So there's a lot of times, obviously, where our preps do go subgingival or, you know, there are undercuts, you know, and to, instead of having to prep away a lot of the tooth structure, there are different things that you can do to modify your prep and be able to, to keep a lot of that, that tooth structure. So this is just showing a couple premolars with some really large amalgams, uh, some fracture lines in the teeth, and um, some recurrent decay underneath. And if you look at the initial prep on the top right, um, there's some undercuts on those, uh, those buccal cusps. When I do upper premolars, I like to leave those buccal cusps and do more of like an onlay on these. Um, I think they, they look more aesthetic because you can keep the buccal surface that matches uh, the adjacent teeth better. And, you know, down the line, if the patient's ever interested in bleaching, you know, you don't have to worry about, well, your crowns aren't going to bleach because you still, you know, you still have the, um, the uh, tooth structure on there. So what I did with these is I placed some composite on the buckle um, side there to kind of fill in those undercuts. And those are my final preps on the lower left. So I have everything super gingival. I have no more undercuts and I'm ready to scan and um, make the final restorations. And you can see those on the bottom right. Um, there's also times where, you know, our, our margins are going to be very subgingival, whether it's due to decay or an old restoration that already is going underneath the gums. If you've tried to see a restoration subgingively, you know, once you've seen it and tried to floss it, you're going to cause the, um, the tissue to start to bleed. So if you could bring those margins up super gingerly first, um, not only will you make your life easier when you go to, to seat your crown, um, but it will be much easier to, to scan the restorations. So on this tooth here, you can see on the left side, uh, tooth number three has a very deep distal decay. Uh, so we did remo remove all the decay. 
and we were a good two, three millimeter subgingival. So um, I banded the tooth and built that up. Um, I use composite, you can use buildup, you can use whatever works better, best in your hands. So you can see looking down on the tooth, I can see all my margins nice and clearly. Uh, on the bottom middle there, you can see that it is super gingival. And then the final restoration on the top. So I would so much rather put this restoration in and not have to worry about uh, aggravating the tissue interproximally between two and three. I can see my restoration without any blood or saliva or anything getting into um, my cement and then potentially not getting a good seal or getting recurrent decay underneath my crown. So I'm going to go through um, some different cases. Um, any questions on prep design or anything like that or anything on CEREC? Not seeing anything so far. Great, thank you. Um, so this patient came in, this is tooth number three. Um, this patient was um, uh, symptomatic, having some uh, hot and cold sensitivity. You can see it is an old uh, composite restoration has you know, some fracture lines in it and um, did have some recurrent decay underneath. So um, yeah, I first sent this patient to, uh, to endo to um, have that treated first. And then I uh, get the patient back and I start my prep design. So on the left here, these are pictures from my scanner. Um, you can see the bluish line all around the tooth. Um, I can see all my margins very clearly. Everything is uh, super gingival. In my contacts, you know, the, the adjacent teeth aren't, you know, blocking uh, any part of my tooth. So I know my that I have a, a good path of insertion on my restoration. And if you don't, if you're at this point and you look at it and say, oh, you know, I, I don't have uh, a good path of insertion, just go back, modify the prep and rescan. It takes, you know, a minute or so to just get rid of um, the undercut. Takes another minute or so to scan, and you're right back here. So it'll save you lots of heartache um, afterward when you go to deliver the crown. Uh, and then on the right here, you can see following um, the occlusal morphology of the tooth, also follows the, uh, the uh, um, opposing dentition. So I have nice, uh, thick, two, at least two millimeters um, of clearance to make my restoration. Now, these, like, uh, I don't know, beige -ish kind of marks here, that is. Basically, if you don't capture that with your scan, it just kind of fills it in. So that's fine when you see it on the gingiva or just kind of here or there on the tooth, uh, on the uh, other teeth. But you really want to make sure that your prep and adjacent contacts are, are nice and clear. So here is my restoration on the left, uh, my design. Um, once you're happy with the design, you can go and mill the tooth. And then this is um, on the, um, the seating. So uh, you can see everything is super gingival, a little irritation from the gums from me, you know, trying to make sure I get all the cement out and, you know, flossing the tooth, but everything is super gingival. Here I left um, a lot of the, the, the buckle um, tooth structure. The, the line doesn't bother me one bit. This is not an aesthetic area. So I would rather have a little less aesthetics and leaving more tooth structure so that I'm not prepping away too much tooth and having you know any issues uh, going forward. And then here are the finals. Um, again, the patient did have a root canal. He eventually ended up losing tooth number four. He fractured a virgin tooth. So this person, um, you know, is a, definitely a very heavy grinder. Um, and I'm still very comfortable in putting a um, ceramic restoration in this. As long as you have really good clearance, the thickness of your, your restoration, you, you're fine. Um, I tend to use a lot of Emacs. So I use Emacs in my posteriors. Um, and you can see the uh, final restoration, different angles here. From the occlusal, I still have some good anatomy there, but I did go in and just kind of smooth it off a little bit. So I don't, you know, if you if you like having a ton of anatomy on your tooth, CEREC is wonderful. If you want to go in and just modify it and smooth it down a little bit, you know, I find that patients uh, prefer that. So that's that's what I do. Um, and you can see the buckles and the linguals. Again, I have a, a line there. It, this is right after uh, cementation, so everything's a little bit dehydrated, so it will blend in a little bit more. Um, and I like to have nice wide contacts, and you can see I have a great contact um, in approximately. 
Um, here is its uh, tooth number 12, had a very large um, amalgam, some recurrent decay and some fractures in it. This one I did um, end up uh, doing a uh, prepping the buckle because I just found it was a little a bit too much compromise to leave. And um, when I removed the silver filling, there was some staining in it. So I didn't want to put on a, a nice new crown and still have like a gray um, tint on the, the buckle surface. So again, I, I went in and thinking I was going to prep you know, just like an onlay on this, but I did um, end up doing a, uh, a 360 crown on this one. So it's really a judgment call as you're working and it really depends on, on, on the tooth. Here are some images of the, um, the scan. So you can see on the right hand side there, everything is super gingival. On the buckle there, I was about a quarter of a millimeter um, super gingival, uh, so I did, go in and just remove a little bit of the tissue so that I knew my scanner will be able to see everything. There was a little bit of bleeding interproximally as well. So um, I, I went in and, and kind of lasered that area to stop that. You can, you know, go in and, and um, pack cord. Um, you can, you know, use some hemoden, you know, whatever works, you know, in your office, but just making sure you get those nice clean margins there. On the top left, you can see your the, the different colors are, are the contact points. So you place the contacts where you want them. If you, you know, if you prefer heavier contacts, you can modify it for that. If you want lighter contacts, you can do that. So it's really in your hands. You're not leaving anything up to the lab to decide for you. You're deciding it for yourself. Um, and I always like to put nice wide contacts. The worst feeling is when you get your, your final restoration, and, you know, it's been milled and it's fired and, and you're ready to put it in and you have an open margin. Um, there are ways that you can add porcelain onto um, the, the restoration and, and fire it and, and get a better contact. I personally would rather not do that. Um, I, so I will make a uh, tighter, wider contact. And if I have too tight of a fit, I'd rather go in and just, you know, reduce that a little bit, a very little bit at a time and then get a good fit that way. Um, Cause open margins are just, they, then you just get behind or, you know, even with, if you're working with a lab, you have to send it back and retemporize the, the tooth. So um, if you prefer to have light contacts, you can adjust that as well. So it is, you are literally your own lab and you can make the teeth exactly how you want it, which is really great. You have total control. And here's the final restorations. You can see on the left is um, uh, the uh, design that I uh, was happy with. Um, I like the look of it and the shape and the cusp. You know, if the cusp was too long or too short, you can go in and, and modify that as, as you please. You can see on the x-ray here on the right, we have great margins. Um, everything is very well fitting. We have nice tight contacts um, with the adjacent teeth as well. And then this is our tooth uh, a few months later. So again, you can, it's, these margins are uh, just above the gum on this tooth and you really wouldn't, wouldn't be able to tell. Uh, the patient doesn't know that the margins you know, are super gingival and a little bit of their tooth is there. It's a very, very aesthetic uh, restoration. Um, the patient's very happy and it's, it's functioning very well. There's nice tight contacts um, overall. Great restoration that was made you know, in just about an hour. Uh, so here is another case with a large uh, failing restoration on tooth number 19 here. Kind of looks like a, a very large inlay onlay type uh, composite. Um, there's some fracturing going on in the adjacent tooth. Now with this tooth, if I had gone in and prepped a 360 crown, I really would lose the, um, the remaining tooth structure that I have on the buccal and lingual. So in something like this, I try to carefully, you know, remove the restoration, any decay, and then see what I have left of the tooth structure and then just kind of modify my prep um, from there. Here you can see in um, the, the images from the scanner on the top left, you can see that I, I left um, some of the buccal margin there. Um, if I go back, Sorry, right there, you know, had a little bit of a fracture line um, on the tooth in here. So obviously I'm going to get rid of that. 
but to bring this all the way down and get rid of all this nice enamel and go super gingival, I saw ginger all that, I, I, I left as much tooth structure as I could. So when you get to this point, you can see all your margins, again, to, um, wrapping the, um, the blue line all around your margins here, and then following the occlusal morphology. You can see the, the tooth structure that I left here. It follows the anatomy of my tooth, and it also follows the um, anatomy of the opposing dentition. So when I see this, I know that I have the, the proper um, space for my occlusion. Again, if you get to this point, and you find you're a little tight in, in an area, and when you design your tooth, you'll get you'll see like a big red mark. Whereas you don't, you know, you want to see more of like a blue or yellow or so. If you see red, you know you don't have enough room, so you may um, want to go back and refine your prep. Or if it's a very small amount, you can when you see your restoration, you can just modify the um, the opposing inclusion if you have a really um, big cusp that you know maybe that cusp was breaking your uh, rest your um, restoration in the first place you may want to just modify that and here is my design again here you can see the blue um, the greenish yellow those are good contacts that I like to see. If I see a red mark, it really kind of depends on where it is. I may go back and modify my prep and just rescan, or um, you can check the um, opposing dentition. Again, if there's a, a large cusp, you can know you can go in and just modify that. And I always like to go in and you know modify my contacts a little bit. On this tooth, you know, the adjacent tooth in front, um, mesially is uh, a premolar, so I'll have a little bit smaller contact there. Um, and then in the, the molar area, I will kind of make that a little bit larger and then um, modify that if I need to when I'm um, seating my crown. And here's our final restoration. You can see, you know, on, on the left that you can you can put the um, opposing dentition in to see, make sure everything fits properly. And then uh, when your tooth is done in about an hour, you put it in, patient goes home happy with a permanent restoration. So here is a tooth with a large um, amalgam restoration and they did have some um, uh, hot and cold sensitivity. So uh, actually, I'm sorry, this one did not really, it had a little bit of sensitivity, so I wasn't sure. Um, you know, if they were going to need endo or not. So when um, I went into the tooth, I, I figured they would kind of need endo. So what's great about CEREC is if you know you don't want to put the final restoration on that at that point and you do need to send them to endo, you can prep, temp your tooth. You could, uh, before you temp, you scan it and you can save your scans so that when the patient goes to have endo, all you really need to do is fill in the, the endo space, which is usually pretty small. Um, you can mill your, your crown before they come in. So, you know, usually it takes about 25 to 30 minutes to, to mill and, and to fire your tooth. So you can do that before the patient comes in so that when they do come in, your restoration is ready, ready to go. You put it in, cement it, and uh, you're done. So even if, say, if you come in for like an emergency and you're by yourself and the patient needs a crown, you prep it, scan it, temp it, and you can make the restoration at any time. You can save anything and go back and, um, and make the restoration uh, at your convenience. So here is the tooth. Um, and again, I can see all my, um, my margins. I can see, you know, through the contacts, it, you know, it was a little bit subgingival on the left. So if it's just a little bit, I'll go in and just, you know, modify the tissue, whether it's with a laser or um, a little uh, cord just to get that out of the way so I can see um, my entire prep in uh, at the design phase. And here we are designing it. This, um, the opposing dentition on this did come down a little bit uh, further on the distal um, of the upper molar. So uh, you have to take that into consideration when you do your prep. And you can see I have a lot of um, contacts here. I did keep a little bit more of the occlusion on these teeth. I didn't smooth it out as much. Um, again, that's total personal preference. You want more, uh, more morphology or less. It is completely up to you. You're in control. 
Oh, no, I'll just show two on these. Um, you can see that the margins are all super gingival too. Um, it's a little tight here, but I probably do have about a half a millimeter on the um, lingual and about a millimeter or two on the buckle. Sprue location is super duper important. So the sprue is that little piece that comes um, off the tooth. That's where, um, when you're milling it, that's where the, it, it'll end the milling. It, it, you can't really end milling on the tooth. So it, it comes off with this little piece there that comes off very easily. Um, my uh, assistants will take that into um, the lab or the room and uh, just take that little piece off. So I, it, but it, it's really hard to get like an exact, exact amount. So usually they'll leave like just a tiny little bit. Um, and then when I'm going in and putting the tooth in and, and polishing and all that, I can polish it right down. Um, but sometimes, you know, they can take too much off and that's not a good thing. So if you leave your sprue in your contact area and you happen to take too much off, you lose your contact. Um, if you happen to not take enough off, you're just constantly taking a little bit, a little bit, a little bit to try to get that contact. And eventually you can lose the contact if you take too much off. So it's really, really important to uh, keep that sprue location on either the buccal or lingual. I tend to leave it more um, on the lingual so that it doesn't mess up um, anything, you know, on the, the buccal facial surfaces. Um, but you take that off before you go to, um, to fire your restoration. And here is our final restoration. Um, you can see um, on uh, the far left that we are a couple millimeters above the gingiva um, in this area here. And in the next image, we are super gingival on the lingual, just by a hair there. Um, on the top right, you can see the anatomy. I you know, have good anatomy, but just kind of you know, smoothed a little bit. Um, and then our uh, final restoration with nice, tight, good contacts. So when you get, again, a, a real subgingival margin, um, you know, this could be really, really hard when you have decay on the distal of number two. This is probably a very, very difficult um, tooth to try to take an impression on. You will constantly be fighting the gums and bleeding and saliva and all that. So on a tooth like this, um, this is one where I would remove the decay and build my margin up again with composite, build up, you know, whatever you want to do um, and then mill my crown. And what's great about this is as you can see on this patient on the lower uh, second molar, there's some decay there. So while I was milling the tooth on tooth number two, I was able to go down and work on the, um, the opposing tooth. So again, efficiency, production, you know, you can really increase um, all of that with, with Sarah. So with this tooth, I went in and removed all the decay. I was, you know, a couple millimeters subgingival. Um, so in situations like that, I, I'll band the tooth and make sure I have a really, really tight seal there because I don't want anything to seep into um, that area when I'm bonding. I want to get a really good bond in that area. Uh, and then again, I'm building it up with composite. At this point, if you're, you know, if you're starting to do this or you're a little unsure, you can stop at this point and take an, um, an x-ray to make sure you have a good seal. Because you do, definitely don't want to put a crown on this tooth if you have an open margin subgingively, because then you know obviously it's going to fail. So um, if you're starting to do these, you can stop, take a quick X-ray, make sure your margins are nice and sealed, and then go ahead with your prep. Um, so on the top right, you can see my margin is now super gingival. I can see my prep, and I'm ready to scan. But here's the final result. You can see on the left here that the, my margin on the crown is a millimeter and a half or so above um, the, uh, the tissue in this area here. And then my buildup um, goes subgingially. Everything is nice and sealed. Um, on the right, I have a great contact with the adjacent tooth. And then when taking an x-ray of it, you can, um, you can see everything is nice and sealed. I am very close to the bone. I am aware of that. Um, this patient, you know, we did go over possibly needing to lengthen that, uh, do a little crown lengthening in that area. What is also really cool about CEREC is when you do that buildup, 
and you're milling your crown, you can go back into that area and remove whatever bone that you need instead of sending this patient, you know, to a specialist, um, having it done, waiting six to eight weeks to come back. Uh, you're you're cutting, you know, months off of treatment. Whereas you can just go in, build that margin up, and you know, see how the patient feels afterward. I can always go back and remove some decay, um, or uh, excuse me, some bone. This was an older patient that really just wasn't interested, so they wanted to, you know, try and see how it feels um, afterward. This was done a few months ago, and I haven't heard anything from the patient. So, um, you know, it was a, uh, so much easier for me to prep the tooth. Uh, to seat my restoration. I'm not fighting any blood um, on the distal there. Um, I was able to, to get a really good restoration. And you can see on uh, tooth number 30 underneath, we're able to get that uh, filling done while the, um, the crown was being built. And you really don't always have to just do single units. Um, you can do multiple units. You can do two, three, five, ten. I mean, however many crowns you want to do at one time. Uh, whatever you can scan, you know, you can make. So, and this patient, this patient had two crown preps um, on uh, 30 and 31, and they were um, just kind of left. Um, they put a little temporary on 30, and maybe they had put one on 31. I don't know, but it had uh, come off anyway. So, uh, we prepped both of these teeth. So normally for one unit, I would book about an hour and 15 minutes. If I do two, I might book an hour and a half uh, because what I do with these cases is I would design them both and then throw uh, start milling one. And then that first one I'll put in the oven and then start milling the second one. So, um, and then once that first one comes out, I can start um, uh, replacing that one while I put the second one in the milling machine. So it's really not a lot of, of downtime. Um, and, and the tooth, uh, both teeth can be put in the same day. You can also design, kind of go back and forth with the design. So it's not like you design one tooth and, you know, that's set in stone and then go and do the other one. You know, if you do the second one, you want to go modify the first one, you can bounce back and forth. So on the lower part of the, um, the scan um, screen, there's two teeth there and they're labeled. One's 30, one's 31. So when you're on 30, that kind of lights up on the bottom. It has a little yellowish around it. And the tooth on top is white. So you know you're working on that one. The other one, the little beige-ish, that one, you know, is kind of on hold right now. It'll design both at the same time, uh, but then you can go in and modify them as needed. And then once you get one crown, you want to go, you know, to the other one. I, I did 30 first and then went back and did 31. And, you know, if I wanted to, I can kind of pop back to 30. So it's uh, really easy to just kind of go back and forth and fit them, you know, as needed. You always want to make sure you have really good contacts, especially when you're doing adjacent ones. Again, I'll leave them a little bit on the tighter side. So when I seat one, um, then I go and seat the second one. If it's a little tight, that's okay. I can go in and, and uh, modify it very slowly as needed. Um, I don't have to go back and, and mill, you know, another one and waste more time and, you know, really um, be inefficient with uh, crown making. So I'll go in and make these just a tad tighter and, uh, and get a much better, much better result. And here's our finals, um, the, uh, the finals on the left hand from the design on the, um, the unit and then the restorations on the right. So I know I have good contacts, um, all my margins are super gingival, and it's very easy to seat these because I can see everything. I'm not, you know, uh, subgingival and, and causing bleeding or anything like that. Um, you check your contacts and you get a really, uh, really good result. So again, like I said, you can scan one at a time, you can scan multiple units, um, however you want to practice, uh, it's totally up to you. You can use it for, um, you know, a full mouth scanning, whether you're doing sleep appliances or orthodontics with clear aligners. You, you really, you know, it, it's, it's used for so many different things. I recommend maybe starting on the more simple side, starting with single restorations and then building up to um, whatever you want to use it for. So thank you so much. I hope um, I covered a lot of good information for you. Um, if there's any questions on Cerex, Preps Designs, um, any um, cases, I'd be more than happy to answer any questions that anyone has. 
Perfect. Let's see. While we give some time for the questions to come in, uh, what would be your number one reason for someone adding an intraoral scanner to their practice? Um, efficiency, increasing production, new patients. Um, patients love technology. So if someone comes to your office, even if they don't see it, if you're just advertising it somewhere, you know, if you put something out in your waiting room, like, oh, we do crowns in an hour, crowns in one visit, um, they inquire about it and they really think you're on the cutting edge. So, you know, I mean, I guess initially I did it because I wanted to do um, the one day dentistry and I wanted to get those crowns done. I wanted to have a little more control over it instead of sending everything to the lab. Um, and, you know, if it comes back and I don't like it, I don't like the color, I don't like the shape, the size, you know, if I don't like it when I do it, it's my fault. So I don't have to send it back to the lab. Um, but you know, that was my initial reason, but I mean, just the benefits of having it have just increased tenfold and, you know, patients just love it and patients talk, they tell their family, they tell their friends like, Hey, I got a crown, you know, today, you know, I don't have a temporary, you know, you know, it was great. I didn't have to, you know, go back, take work off. So, um, it really is just such a huge, huge practice builder. Got a comment here saying Sarek is great for aesthetic crowns, but not sure if they're strong enough for the long haul posteriors. Do you do other stronger restorations with Sarek or just send directly to the lab? Um, I do them um, with Sarek. Um, the, the lab is basically using the same materials, you know, whether you're, um, you know, using like an Emax or a zirconia or something, you can make them in your office. So, um, you know, unless you want to do a PFM or gold or something, if you're doing all ceramics, Sarah can do it. So um, I'm very comfortable putting ceramics on even second molars. The key is just having um, the thickness of your material and good occlusion. You know, you always want to check your occlusion afterwards. So um, if you have those two things, it will last as long as any other type of restoration. All right. I know you said you didn't have too much or if any uh, experience with Prime Scan, but do you know anything about a Prime Scan Omnicam? comparison at all um i don't so i started when blue cam came out so i had that for a while and then um switched over to omnicam i'm super happy with it i mean if i you know were to get one today obviously i'd get prime scan um i don't i haven't used one uh but um i mean i i just got an upgrade with the omnicam um you know with the windows and all that stuff, everything constantly changing with technology. Um, but I find it's very fast. It's um, very precise. I have no issues with it. Um, I know people that have prime scan and they, they love it. They, um, it's really easy to do um, full mouth scans. I think prime scan is a little bit easier to do full mouth scans. So, um, you know, if you're looking to do more of that, um, obviously prime scan would be the better choice. What do you cement these restorations with? Um, most of the time I use Panavia. Uh, I just find that that works really well. If I have someone, uh, if I'm doing like a lower second molar and the person is just very, um, salivating and in all that, um, I'll use a Reli X so I don't have to, this is, so there's not as many steps. Um, but I like using the Panavia. I like to kind of just, um, uh, tack it and then remove some excess cement and then fully cure it. Um, I find Reli-X is a little bit harder to remove, um, but if I need to do it quick uh, and not, you know, do as many steps, I use, I use Reli-X. All right. Well, I think we got through all the questions. Yep, looks like that. We will end right on the hour. So thank you so much, Dr. Kurtz, as always. And of course, thanks to everyone for attending. I hope you all enjoyed tonight's webinar, as I certainly did. We do appreciate your feedback via our survey that will pop up on your screen shortly. We did record tonight's webinar, so those of you who joined late or if you missed most of it, we will email the recording out to you via email sometime in the next week. With that said, we are done, so thank you everyone and have a great night. Thank you. Good night. Good night.